Um, hello, my name is uh, Salve Nilsen. I'm from the Oslo Perl community. Um, and I'm here to uh, share some ideas and thoughts and uh, what's going on around SBOMs, Software Bill of Materials in the Perl and CPAN world. Uh, I'll try to be short because I don't want uh, on this because I don't want to keep you from lunch, uh, and I expect there might be some questions. I'm hoping at least for some, so I'll, I'll rush through some of the boring bits, uh, bits and uh, uh, try to stop at uh, the, some key points that to give you an illustration, an idea of what we're talking about when it comes to software building materials. So um, I'd like you guys to imagine for a moment that you're at work and then somebody comes and whispers to you that there is an absolutely serious uh, security vulnerability uh, that has been announced. Um, and uh, to get to an, uh, an idea of what this could be in real life, uh, we have some uh, existing his historic actual vulnerabilities like Heartbleed and Solar Winds, which was a data breach, and Log4Shell, which I hope all of you have heard about. So that's OpenSSL, which is used everywhere. I have a Java logging library, which turned out to be used everywhere. And a major data breach that uh, the Amer got the Americans really scared uh, a few while back, a while back. So imagine um, uh, you hear about something like this, and can you answer a few questions? Do you know if any of your software is uh, affected? And it's any of your software that you are using in any part of your organization. And uh, can you quickly figure out where it is used? So you don't have to manually search for it like we, we used to do uh, a few years ago when Log4J, uh, Log4Shell came out. And uh, can you figure it out, out even if some of your dependencies are indirect or transitive? They are dependencies that you have that pull in their own dependencies. You need an overview of that too if, you, if you're going to figure out if some, some uh, uh, bits, seven, eight, nine, ten steps down the dependency tree that introduces log for uh, j Maybe an old version of it. Um, and how about software that's out of your control, open source software? Most of the businesses out there at least uh, where I'm uh, operating, like uh, Norway, we have, I've seen numbers around 80 to 95% of all software that's being used depends on open source at some point, at some place in their dependency tree. It could be as basic as running on a Linux server. Then you, you, you depend on open source. Or, or if you use an op open source ecosystem like Perl, then of course, that is the, you'll be using CPAN, and that's open source, and you don't control that stuff. But you still need to know it's in use, and what is in use, which versions, and everything. So this happened, and uh, that led a bunch of legislators to say, oh, uh, uh, we can't do this. this. This was actually pretty disruptive for societies around there. So in the US, uh, Mr. President Biden decided in an executive order to uh, introduce uh, some demands to federal agencies and anyone who wants to do business with them uh, on how to in improve uh, cybersecurity issues around stuff like this. This was in May in 21, and it applies to all contractors and, and institutions that do something like that. And same, a few years later, uh, was uh, uh, that EU introduced the NIST 2 directive, which was, uh, made into, um, uh, accepted into EU law uh, last year in, in November, if I remember correctly. Yes, no, October actually, no, uh, yeah, November. Um, and that applies to any, any business that uh, uh, has uh, uh, software used in critical infrastructure in Europe or suppliers of those softwares. softwares. And then we have the Cyber Resiliency Act. Uh, um, who, which is currently um, uh, under development. I expect it to go through Parliament in September sometime, maybe. We'll see. 
um, uh, and they apply to uh, any software that is being used on internet connected devices from switches and routers to the management software that is used to do remote updates of those or to even toys that connect online to get some some uh, uh, speech to text uh, service up and running or whatever is necessary so you can have a, a philosophic uh, conversation with your toy with chat GPT <laughs> Uh, or, or your uh, um, Alexa, or whatever. This stuff here uh, are laws either already in effect or coming soon uh, as, a, as a consequence of those security incidents. Um, so that means a bunch of us are going to be affected uh, um, uh, of this. And what the, these laws in general ask for is that we keep track of our dependencies so that we know what's going on. And we have to keep track of it across language ecosystems, uh, independent of sources, uh, with all of the metadata that's necessary to be able to detect if a new when a new vulnerability arrives, whether, whether or not you are vulnerable yourself, which software that needs updating so you can respond uh, in a, a responsible manner. Uh, so that's where SBOMs come in. Uh, software Bill of Materials are meant to be a, a, a kind of a standardized document format to communicate these things. Uh, just for a little bit of an uh, illustration of what I mean with, uh, with dependencies, we have an application, we have different dependencies, some of them are on DarkPan, which is the company internal CPAN mirror with our own uh, uh, packages, maybe. Some of it is on CPAN. Maybe there are some dependencies that aren't on CPAN anymore, so you pull them down from backpan until you, you find time one day to upgrade it. And each of them might have further de uh, dependencies, and some of them might have dependencies that are just outside of Perl, outside of CPAN like a, a compiled library. How was that library built? Who built it? Uh, uh, what was the compile flags? Where did you get the source? All this is really useful questions to have an answer to when shit hits the fan, so to speak. And you kind of have to, the point with these laws is that you, you're supposed to prepare for the day when shit hits the fan so you actually can answer those questions really quickly. So, um, this brings us to SBOMs. What is it, actually? Uh, there are two standards that are pretty, uh, somewhat uh, out there in use, um, common. It's OWASP's uh, CycloneDX, which I personally prefer, and uh, the software packet data exchange, SPDX, which might, some of you might already know because they, they were pretty early out in having a standardized uh, list of uh, licensing licenses. And there are some, uh, some CPAN packages that uh, do that, but they, they have over the years they've been uh, expanded to also cover dependencies and a bunch of other things. But Cyclone DX, which I'm going to show a little bit to you eventually, is a lot more comprehensive. That's why I pr pr uh, um, uh, propose those. Uh, but uh, in order to have a, a, a way to keep track of dependencies across ecosystems, we need to have a, a sensible way of identifying software. Um, there are three standards for software identification. One is called Common Platform Enumeration. That's the horrible thing at the bottom there. This is used in the US. I have no idea why they did it this way. Uh, I, I, I look at this and say, oh shit. But uh, there are some uh, vulnerability databases out there which are super useful that uh, where you can query uh, with this uh, syntax and get quick response if there's an, an active vulnerability out there. So we have some CPAN packages that use this format uh, on CPAN, uh, uh, so, so it's still relevant. Um, and this format is also used in Cyclone DX when referring to software packages. Then we have something called software ID. If you want to know how that works, you have to pay 187 euro to uh, the ISO. Uh, so I'm gonna skip this. I don't want to pay that. I'm an open source developer, and if they want to give me this standard, hey, cool. I'm not going to pay for it. And you have something called package URL, 
which uh, is basically an uh, attempt at describing a package including version and all the informa information that is necessary to identify a specific uh, package, uh, uh, including where it comes from. So a CPAN package would have this URL, some, something from uh, a Debian apt repository we might have a package colon Debian slash and then the name of the package and at version number, for example. And there's a whole lot of ecosystems already supported with this. CPAN support is on the way in, thanks to uh, a, an Italian friendly guy who has, has recently started uh, uptake, uh, publishing stuff. Um, so, what can go into an SBOM? Let's see, I have, have to finish in 10 minutes, and this is a lot of material. Um, there are, uh, at least in the US, they came with a, a set of minimum requirements. Um, these are the ones they explicitly asked for. Uh, supplier name, component name, version is already in there. Same with how, what dependencies you are. They also want unique identifiers, alternative identifiers. We don't support that in our meta files yet. Uh, or or uh, author of the, any metadata in the SBOM or a, a timestamp. And there might be a bunch of other things that we could put in there. So when we're talking about CPAN and this kind of metadata, um, we need to expand the, the stuff we're keeping uh, uh, in there. Um, and with this metadata, what, what do we have it for? What, we can, use, what can we use it for? We have, can use it for component inventory. We're already doing that, but now we have the, a way to do it across ecosystems. And this is the JSON version of uh, Cyclone DX. You can also uh, write it in XML. There's a separate uh, specification for that. I like JSON, so we'll put it there. And you can see it has some basic uh, expected things like schema, uh, which format we're talking about, which spec version we have, serial numbers, so we can identify um, uh, this release, I think. I don't, I'm not totally sure. And uh, which component we depend on. Um, this is all fully spe specified on uh, the Cyclone, Cyclone DX website, which uh, I, is linked here on the top. So if you uh, download my slides at some point, uh, uh, you will be able to follow this and check all out all the examples of that page. So the inventory is there. Known vulnerabilities is something you might want to keep track of. Uh, meaning that you, you might have software that you are aware of vulnerabilities and you want to specify for the aud aud uh, auditor when they come and check if everything is okay, that you know it and why haven't you upgraded, you can t basically tell it uh, there. Um, you can also check for integrity uh, by looking for uh, MD5 hashes or SHA-256 hashes of the content. You store them in SBOM so you later can do a manual check if someone has tampered with the, the, the software uh, on root or, or uh, on disk. Um, you can look at authenticity. Does Do I have the package that the author actually published? This is super useful sometimes. It, uh, uh, this is a way to make sure that we can keep uh, actually know that by having the signatures there and, and checking that. Uh, License compliance is already a thing that has been ex has existed for many many years now. You can still do it with the SBOMs. So check if you have to figure out if there's something, some GPL licenses in your uh, uh, dependency tree. Try by a little bit uh, a few extra uh, requirements. Um, then here you can know that how you put put together soft your software is useful. What compile flags did you use? What compiler did you use if you use that? Um, uh, and a bunch of other information like that could be, uh, you could store that in the SBOM. Um, uh, since the SBOM is something that comes, is supposed to come with a, a package, and then the, the package, the, old, the, the one that uses this package needs to produce another SBOM for itself and its dependencies. It means uh, uh, you get uh, uh, one file that includes uh, 
the components and its subcomponents and dependencies listed uh, after each other, which is uh, really nice uh, to get a quick idea of what's actually installed uh, across ecosystems. Um, provenance, uh, meaning uh, you uh, you store uh, exactly how you got your package. Say, for example, if you downloaded it from your own dark pan, you make sure you store it, the URL you got in your software from there. If something was changed, uh, you might look at the pedigree of the software. Like, what variants do you have a local security patch uh, that you have applied? You store it in the SBOM to make sure you communicate that this is not the original uh, uh, software uh, downloaded from uh, CBAN. This is something we have uh, modified for our specific purposes, and we know that the checksums are different. Um, uh, you might also want to keep track of all the packaging and distribution these days. Like if you get something from um, uh, from your package from uh, AppGet or from uh, your RPM server, uh, here specify that. Um, how about to check if something you, uh, is complete? That's actually a, a, an important thing. So when you make a, a, a you have, have produced a SBOM file together with your application before you sign off that this is now finished, you you basically attest that you have checked everything is complete. You sign the whole thing, and la later when some auditor comes in and checks uh, there, then it it includes uh, the claim that yeah I did check it this, and here's my att attestation for that. That's actually also useful. And if you have temporary workarounds, uh, you can also uh, store this in the SBOM just to communicate that there is something on the way here that while we're waiting for upstream to fix, here's our temporary solution. And if an auditor comes or some security people come and say, what is going on here? Then you can just see, okay, this is you guys are in, uh, uh, on top of things. And if you know about some exploitable feature in your software that you cannot address for some reason, then you can explicitly say, we know of this uh, vulnerability, we are not going to uh, fix it, uh, here's why. And the auditors can come in and uh, say, okay, well, you at least know what you're doing. It's not a surprise here going on. Maybe you, you may do something else, turn off a feature or something to remedy it in, uh, while waiting for uh, fixing the, the, the underlying problem. And you can also keep track of security advisors that are relevant and more. Because there's a lot of tooling already out there. Uh, uh, quite a few uh, systems uh, and ecosystems use SBOM as part of the way they do things. We don't in the Perl community. So while we don't, we can still use some of the tooling used in Java or, or NPM or, or Ruby or whatever, uh, both for analysis and reporting and putting stuff together and verification and uh, making reports and checking for conformance and all that stuff. This is good. So maybe you got a hint. Are SBOM supported in CPAN? The core short answer is not today. Uh, this kind of sucks. Uh, we, we, I'm going to say we, would like to change this because um, there is something called the CPAN Security Working Group. I uh, mentioned this on uh, the Lightning Talks on Monday on this, in this conference. Uh, uh, anyone here who cares about security or has a security aware employer as, are welcome to join us to try to resolve some of these things and make uh, the CPAN ecosystem uh, work better uh, in this regard. Uh, we kind of need a little bit of our resources because there's a lot to do and these laws uh, will be coming into effect next year. So getting in front of this work is probably a good idea. And I hope uh, we're, looking, we're looking for volunteers. So please step up if you, if you know someone or if you can do something. Um, that's what I had to say. 
if you want to reach out to us, uh, website is security.metasepan.org. You can actually also write security.sepan.org and end up at our website. And we have a GitHub page, uh, uh, an organization linked from that page. And you can reach us, uh, out to us on IRC uh, on uh, uh, Perlorg. And we have a mailing list on Perlorg. Um, thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, one question. Uh, the um, the SBOM being supported in CPAN, will this also require action on the part of module con contributors to CPAN? Or will this be something which is, which is built into CPAN and will support the users of those modules? Um, uh, I'm, uh, this is still an ongoing discussion, but my expectation is that we will have to actually make upgrades to the tooling, like uh, uh, CPAN minus, uh, CPAN dot PM, uh, CPM, uh, module build, module ex uh, util make maker, and, and everything related that creates, uh, like meaning builds and maybe tests and installs stuff, so that it also produces an SPOM file in addition to the meta.yaml file or meta.json file. So it's kind of a an, an extra step where we already have uh, uh, something similar happening, uh, but the thing that is most um, frustrating, maybe I don't know, is that there will we will have to add some new metadata, and each and every developer out there who expects to have their software being adopted in a strict usage environment, like, like in a critical infrastructure setting, for example. They, they will probably be asked, could you please add the security contact information or stuff like that to your metadata? And that means we'll have to update uh, the, met the CPAN meta spec at some point to add the fields. And when that's up and running, we, uh, we already discuss uh, how to expose this kind of information on meta CPAN. So it will be able to signal that some information might be missing or uh, or different stuff eventually, but uh, the uh, my hope and our hope is that we can get the bits and pieces and infrastructure in place so that uh, next time someone makes a new release with updated tooling, it just happens co uh, correctly, and maybe they get a question saying, uh, Psst, "You need to fill out this one th because this is so kind of important if you want to have your software used in Europe or the U.S. Uh, government." Is that the question, answer for your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry, just a quick remark. We have to add these new features into the quality checking. That's uh, one way of uh, doing it. Um, uh, we'll have to look at that, because the quality checks uh, are mostly to check if something we know is bad it, it, it is not there. And we can do uh, have a set of quality checks that are related to this. And uh, that shouldn't be a big deal, but uh, quite possible. Uh, patches are welcome if you feel that this is something you want to do.